Hi guys, welcome back to Behind the Sawdust, our weekly-ish vlog where we show you what goes on when the cameras are off here at the two Stumpy Nubs Woodworking Journal shops. This time we're going to take a break from woodworking and talk about a subject we get asked about all the time, the equipment we use to produce the video content over at Stumpy Nubs Woodworking Journal. This time we'll talk about cameras, and in future episodes we'll cover lighting, audio equipment, editing software, the works. I'll also give you some tips for getting started making your own videos. This is going to be fun. So let's start with cameras. In a couple of minutes I'll go over the differences between video cameras, DSLRs, and other types so you can decide which is best for you. But first, let's go through the cameras I've used over the years and what particular features I found most useful. I actually started out with a video camera much like this one. It records onto little cassette tapes which have to then be transferred to your computer using a firewire cable. If you don't know what firewire is, well, most computers haven't had that in a long time. This was back in the pre-HD days on YouTube when videos were allowed to look terrible. But you can't get away with that anymore. So eventually we made the jump to DSLRs. This was one of our first. It's the Canon Rebel T3i. The Rebel series is Canon's budget DSLR line. But they're good cameras. The T3i has been a workhorse for a lot of YouTube creators, and many are still using this camera today doesn't have a lot of frills, but it shoots in full HD and it's pretty easy to use. I believe this was the first Canon model to have an articulating screen, which is pretty important if you're going to be operating your own camera. You want to be able to see yourself in frame from in front of the lens. Shortly after I got my T3i, Canon came out with their T4i, which was the first to feature a touch screen. I upgraded because I liked the idea of simply touching the area of the screen that I needed in focus, and then letting the autofocus take it from there, that's a great feature that, in my opinion, made the T3i obsolete. Since then, Canon has made some more upgrades, and I think they're up to like the T7i now. But eventually, I got away from the Rebel camera line and moved up to their next level of DSLRs. See, Canon has different tiers of DSLR cameras. The Rebel line with the T's in the models, like the T3i, T4i, T5i are the lower end at around 600 to 700 new, depending on the model. The next level up are the models with two digits and a D, like the 50D, 60D, 70D, and so on. These cost about $1,000 to $1,300. They're a more robust camera. They're a little bit bigger. They have metal skeletons inside to protect them from drops, and they're sealed up so they're resistant to water and dust. That was a big feature for me in upgrading because I work in a dusty environment, so I wanted my camera protected. I'm not sure how important that is, because like I said, a lot of people have been using the T3i, for example, for years in a dusty environment, but I wanted to be on the safe side. However, the biggest reason I upgraded when the 70D came out was their new autofocus technology, which allows you to touch the area of the screen that you want to come into focus while you're filming. On the T4i, you could touch focus only before you started filming. But with the 70D, you can do it while filming and it's super fast and accurate. You can actually do some really neat rack focus shots, which means starting with an object in the foreground in focus and then quickly switching the focus to an object in the background just by touching different points on the screen. This sort of thing looks really cool. I love this camera. However, as much as I love my 70D, I almost never used it because right after I bought it, the first 4K cameras first started coming out. So I bought the Panasonic GH4. This was an expensive upgrade. With the lens, this thing cost me about $2,500 at the time. I think they're down below $2,000 now. Now you may wonder why I would want a 4K camera when we post videos on YouTube in regular HD, not 4K. Well, it all comes down to flexibility. You see, when you film a scene with an HD camera, you have to zoom in and frame the scene exactly as you want it to look before you start recording. Because if you try to digitally zoom in with your editing software later, you're going to lose resolution. There's only so many pixels on the screen. If you zoom in on just a portion of the image, you're reducing the number of pixels that are seen in that image, and it's going to look terrible. But a 4K image has four times as many pixels. So I can zoom in digitally to an area as small as 25% of the image, and I still have the same number of pixels on the screen as with full HD video. That's huge, especially if you're operating your own camera. 
because you can just zoom out from whatever you're filming, making sure you get everything you could possibly want in the frame. Then later at your computer, you can zoom in and even pan around the image. It's like having a camera operator that you can send back in time and say, you know what, now that I see this video, I wish you would have zoomed in on that or panned left here or right there, so go fix it. Is having that ability worth spending a couple of grand on a camera? To me it was, because I don't always have a camera operator, especially while I'm building projects. Plus the GH4 has all sorts of other cool features like focus peaking that puts a little green outline around whatever is in focus on the LCD screen so you don't have to trust your eyes and a lot of other things. Now these Canon cameras are DSLRs, which means that there's a mirror inside that reflects the image that is coming in through the lens up to a sensor. The Panasonic is a mirrorless camera, which isn't technically a DSLR, but it's classified as the same sort of thing because of the interchangeable lenses and all that stuff. There are a lot of reasons to use these types of cameras, and we'll get into that in a couple minutes. But the biggest downside for me was the audio. They only have one 3.5 millimeter jack, but a lot of professional mics have bigger XLR connectors, and I wanted to connect two at once. You can't do that on a DSLR without a separate piece of equipment. So I was using a separate audio controller. The mics attached to that, then a wire ran up to the camera. That worked fine in the shop as long as I remembered to get everything properly connected and turned on, which didn't always happen. But when I had to go somewhere and I needed the mics, it was a big pain to tote all this stuff around. So I started looking for a camera with dual XLR microphone inputs. Incidentally, you can buy an attachment for the Panasonic GH4 with that feature, but it's an extra $1,000 on top of the $2,500 camera. So now you're starting to get in the price range of a full-on prosumer video camera without all the other features that those cameras offer. So I decided to just make the switch from DSLRs and back to video cameras. The one I settled on is actually taking this video right now. It's the Panasonic DVX200. I chose this one mostly because it was one of the best ones out there on the prosumer level. A prosumer camera is a camera with many of the features of a professional movie camera that's designed for people like you and me that don't work at movie studios. This is a big investment and near $5,000. And yes, that hurt, but it does everything and it does it very well. Besides being able to hook up two professional microphones, and being able to shoot in 4K, it also has all sorts of other features that can be accessed with buttons and dials on the camera body rather than having to go through the menus like you do in DSLRs. And the DVX200 has a very high quality lens and image sensor so that it will still catch the shallow depth of field that you would otherwise only get with DSLRs. But chances are you aren't going to invest that kind of money in a video camera, so there's no need for me to go on and on about its features. The bottom line is it gives me everything in one piece of equipment that's tough enough to take some heavy use in a dusty environment. And after doing this for several years, using several different types of cameras, I've learned that convenience is very important when choosing a camera. Before we move on, I wanted to say something about another resource I found helpful for what we do over at Stumpy Nubs Woodworking Journal, Graphic Stock. It's a membership service that offers a downloadable library of graphics, photos, and vector images. If you do a simple keyword search, something like wood for example, you get thousands of images that can be used for web pages, video title backgrounds, thumbnails, all sorts of things, without the risk of getting sued that comes with just grabbing an image off the internet. And that's just one example. They have hundreds of thousands of selections that you get unlimited lifetime use of. That sure beats the 20 to 30 bucks per image that other sites are charging, which can really add up fast. Graphic stock is usually 99 bucks a year for unlimited downloads with a 100% royalty free agreement. But right now they have a holiday deal going on where you get a $50 discount. So it's essentially half off. So if you want to spruce up your website or videos, check it out at graphicstock.com or in the link in the notes below the video. So what camera should you choose? You want a camera that requires minimal setup to get a good crisp image. For some people, a phone or a point and shoot digital camera fits that bill as long as you can easily attach a good quality microphone to it. But there are other factors that make it worth checking into a more robust camera. First, ease of focus. Some people go on and on about how they only use manual focus, blah, blah, blah. 
Well, when I'm filming a build, I want my camera to do that for me because it's faster and it's more accurate than my eyes looking at a tiny little screen to see if something's in focus. I want a camera that I can rely upon to get the focus right for me. That's why I like cameras with touch screens that allow me to touch the part of the image that I want in focus and then just let the camera take it from there. I especially like if I can change focus with the touch screen while recording, but that feature isn't critical if you're operating your own camera. It's also important that the camera allows me to turn off the continuous autofocus feature because I don't want the focus to be jumping around if I pass my hand in front of the lens, which happens a lot if you don't turn that feature off. I also want a camera that can find focus quickly without going back and forth trying to lock onto something. So before you buy a camera, take a good look at how the autofocus features work. That's a huge factor. Another factor you should consider is durability. Cheaper cameras, particularly DSLRs, are not designed to be dropped. And in a workshop where you have a tripod sitting right next to you while you work, that's bound to happen. The better DSLR cameras have steel or titanium skeletons under the coating, and they're sealed against dust. Perhaps even more important than the camera itself being sealed is the lens, because you're definitely going to get dust inside an inexpensive lens. Yet another factor to consider is screen size. Even if you're using autofocus, you still want to be able to see the image well enough to adjust for lighting, color balance, that sort of thing. This is where the small point-and-shoot cameras and even most DSLRs fall behind in my opinion. The screen size is pretty small. A dedicated video camera will often have a larger screen, which is a big plus. And finally, picture quality. I'm listing this last because all the things we've been discussing are big factors when it comes to picture quality, but the camera itself is also a major factor. DSLRs produce fantastic images with shallow depth of field. That means you can have something in the foreground in sharp focus while the background is blurred. That looks great on film and is one of the biggest factors that draw people to DSLRs. But unless you're trying to make your videos really cinematic, and there's some debate about whether that actually draws more views or not, you should probably consider that feature well below the other ones I've listed. It's far more important that your camera be easy to set up, easy to use, easy to focus accurately, well built and durable, and with an LCD screen that's big enough to see. To me, a dedicated prosumer video camera is the best of both worlds, especially if it'll shoot in 4K for the reasons we discussed earlier. You don't have to spend $5,000 to get a good professional quality camera. You can get it in the price range of a mid-range DSLR. But believe me, I've tried all sorts of cameras. There's a reason most pros that shoot DVDs and streaming videos use dedicated video cameras now. They're compact, durable workhorses, that are easy to use on the fly and will take a beating. But what if you're just starting out and you don't have the budget for an expensive camera? Then I suggest you get a small point and shoot digital camera and you use it until you decide if you're going to do this professionally. As long as you control your lighting, you can get some great video with one of these. As a side note, some YouTubers have been using GoPro cameras now. This is one of the new ones that has the built-in LCD screen on the back, which is really nice. But I don't recommend using this for your first or only camera because you lose a lot of important features in exchange for the compact size, and that 500 bucks could better be put towards a nice video camera down the road. Of course, cameras are just one piece of the production equipment a professional YouTuber uses these days. Next month, we'll talk about editing software. In the meantime, be sure to check out the latest issue of Stumpy Nubs Woodworking Journal. You can read and subscribe for free over at StumpyNubs.com. Then you can sit back and have yourself a cold one, because you've earned it, my friend.